1944. While Allied forces stormed Normandy, another American innovation was proving itself in the most hostile environment on Earth, 600 feet beneath the Atlantic Ocean. The Fairbanks Morse opposed piston diesel engine powered the submarines hunting Nazi U-boats through the dark water. It was the most power-dense engine the Navy had ever deployed. Compact, reliable, and brutally efficient. Fairbanks Morse took that same engine technology and put it on rails. For two decades, their locomotives dominated specific niches of American railroading. The opposed piston design delivered power that EMD and ALCO couldn't match in the same footprint. Railroads operating in mountainous terrain loved them. Switching yards relied on them. The Milwaukee Road bought them by the hundreds. But by 1963, Fairbanks Morse had abandoned locomotive production entirely. The company that built engines tough enough for submarine warfare couldn't survive in the railroad market. Their locomotives, once celebrated as engineering marvels, became maintenance nightmares that railroads desperately wanted to retire. The opposed piston engine that made them unique became the liability that killed them. This is the story of brilliant engineering defeated by operational economics. This is how Fairbanks Morse built submarines on rails and why railroads learned to hate them. Fairbanks Morse wasn't a railroad company that dabbled in other industries. They were an industrial conglomerate that happened to build locomotives. The company started in 1893 manufacturing scales and windmills for Midwestern farms. By the 1930s, they'd expanded into stationary diesel engines for power generation, pumps for municipal water systems, and eventually military applications. When World War II began, the Navy needed compact, powerful diesel engines for submarines. Traditional inline engines were too long. V-configuration engines were too wide. Fairbanks Morse proposed something radical, an opposed piston engine developed from German designs, two pistons per cylinder, one moving up from the bottom, one moving down from the top, meeting in the middle where combustion occurred. No cylinder heads, no valves, just pistons, connecting rods, and two crankshafts, one at the top of the engine, one at the bottom. The opposed piston configuration delivered extraordinary power density, a 10-cylinder Fairbanks Morse model, 38D8, produced 1,600 horsepower from an engine that was shorter and narrower than a comparable inline diesel. The Navy loved it. Submarines like the Gato class and Balao class used Fairbanks Morse engines throughout the war. They ran for thousands of hours submerged, producing the electrical power submarines needed for propulsion, life support, and weapon systems. After the war, Fairbanks Morse looked at the railroad industry and saw opportunity. Diesel electric locomotives were replacing steam across America. EMD dominated with their two stroke 567 engine. Alco competed with four stroke inline designs. But Fairbanks Morse had something neither competitor could offer proven opposed piston technology that delivered more horsepower per cubic foot than any engine in railroad service. In 1944, Fairbanks Morse entered the locomotive market with the Model 38D818 engine essentially a scaled-up submarine diesel. Eight cylinders, 16 pistons, two crankshafts, 1,000 horsepower. They installed it in a streamlined passenger locomotive and called it the Erie Built, named after their manufacturing facility in Erie, Pennsylvania. Railroads noticed immediately. The opposed piston design was physically smaller than EMD's power assemblies, which meant more room for fuel tanks and better weight distribution. By 1947, Fairbanks Morse had developed the Model 38 D8 engine to 1,500 horsepower and installed it in their first road freight locomotive, the Consolidated Line, later redesignated the H1544. The Milwaukee Road, operating through the Rocky Mountains and the Cascade Range, ordered them specifically for mountain grades. The opposed piston engine delivered high continuous tractive effort, the sustained pulling power needed for long climbs, without overheating. The technical advantages were real. Opposed piston engines have inherently balanced reciprocating forces. Each piston's movement is countered by its opposing partner, which reduces vibration. The absence of cylinder heads eliminated a common failure point in traditional diesels. The engine ran cooler because combustion occurred in the center of the cylinder, away from any fixed surface that could accumulate heat stress. Fairbanks Morse's engineers claimed their design was fundamentally superior, and in pure thermodynamic terms, they were right. The opposed piston engine achieved better thermal efficiency than EMD's two-stroke design because the combustion chamber shape promoted more complete fuel burning. In controlled testing, Fairbanks Morse locomotives showed fuel consumption advantages of 5 to 8% compared to equivalent EMD units. Railroads bought them. 
the Milwaukee Road operated over 130 Fairbanks Morse units by 1956. The Southern Railway purchased H1644 and H2466 models for switching and branch line service. The Pennsylvania Railroad, the New York Central, the Reading, they all ran Fairbanks Morse locomotives in various applications. For specialized operations where high tractive effort in a compact package mattered, Fairbanks Morse delivered. But the operational reality was far uglier than the engineering theory. The opposed piston engine required two crankshafts synchronized by gear trains. If the timing between the upper and lower crankshafts drifted even slightly out of specification, the pistons would collide in the cylinder. That destroyed the engine instantly. Maintaining crankshaft synchronization required precision adjustment and constant monitoring, skills most railroad mechanics didn't have because they'd trained exclusively on EMD and ALCO designs. The engine had no cylinder heads, which eliminated one maintenance concern, but it also meant accessing the pistons, rings, and cylinder liners required disassembling massive sections of the engine block. Changing power assemblies on an EMD-567 took a trained crew four hours. Accessing a failed cylinder on a Fairbanks Morse 38D8 could take two days. Railroads measured downtime and lost revenue. Every hour a locomotive sat in the shop was money hemorrhaging. The lubrication system was a nightmare. With two crankshafts and 16 connecting rods in an eight-cylinder engine, the oil circulation demands were extreme. The engine required high-pressure oil delivery to keep the heavily loaded bearings from seizing. If oil pressure dropped even momentarily, bearings failed, rods broke, and catastrophic damage resulted. EMD's 567 engine tolerated brief oil pressure losses. Fairbanks Morse engines did not. Railroad mechanics hated working on them. The opposed piston design meant every repair required specialized tools and knowledge that was useless on the EMD and ALCO units that made up the vast majority of most railroad fleets. Shops couldn't standardize training or parts inventory. Fairbanks Morse locomotives became the orphans, machines that required dedicated expertise and separate supply chains. The fuel injection system used a unique design that didn't share parts with any other locomotive manufacturer. When injectors failed, railroads couldn't borrow parts from other units. They had to order directly from Fairbanks Morse and wait. In an industry where keeping locomotives in service was paramount, parts availability delays were unacceptable. Worse, the engines developed a reputation for cracking cylinder liners. The opposed piston design created tremendous thermal stress at the point where combustion occurred. The center of the cylinder where both pistons met. Over time, liners developed cracks that allowed combustion gases to escape into the cooling system. This caused overheating, coolant contamination, and eventual engine failure. Repairing cracked liners meant a complete engine teardown, a process that could sideline a locomotive for weeks. The Milwaukee Road initially loved their Fairbanks Morse fleet. The locomotives handled mountain grades beautifully, but as the 1950s progressed, maintenance costs spiraled out of control. The railroad's mechanical department calculated that Fairbanks Morse units required nearly twice the shop time per thousand miles compared to EMD locomotives. That meant higher labor costs, more parts expenses, and fewer revenue earning days. Other railroads reached the same conclusion. The Southern Railway, after operating H1644 switchers for several years, quietly stopped ordering new Fairbanks Morse units and started standardizing on EMD power. The Reading Railroad tried using H2466 Trainmaster locomotives, massive 2,400 horsepower units that were the most powerful single-engine diesels available in 1953. They were spectacular when they worked. They spent too much time in the shop not working. Fairbanks Morse's engineering brilliance couldn't overcome operational economics. Railroads didn't just buy locomotives. They bought into maintenance ecosystems. When 90% of your fleet is EMD, every mechanic knows EMD systems. Every parts warehouse stocks EMD components. Every service manual, every training program, every diagnostic procedure is built around EMD standards. Introducing a fundamentally different engine architecture created support costs that overwhelmed any fuel efficiency advantages. The company tried to adapt. In 1953, Fairbanks Morse introduced the train master, the H2466. It used a 12-cylinder opposed piston engine producing 2,400 horsepower making it the most powerful single-engine diesel-electric locomotive in the world. The trainmaster could haul freight trains that required two EMD GP7s. The math seemed obvious. One trainmaster at $300,000 versus two GP7s at $200,000 each. The Fairbanks Morse unit was cheaper and only required one crew. But railroads didn't see it that way. If a trainmaster failed, the entire train stopped. If one GP7 in a two-unit consist failed, 
the other GP7 could limp the train to a siding. Operational flexibility mattered more than headline horsepower. Railroads also realized that a 2,400-horsepower locomotive wasn't always necessary. Many trains only needed 1,500 to 1,800 horsepower. Using a train master on those assignments meant operating an oversized, maintenance-intensive machine on runs, where it provided no advantage. The reliability problems persisted. Train masters developed a reputation for electrical failures in addition to the mechanical issues plaguing earlier Fairbanks Morse models. The electrical generators and traction motors used in train masters were larger and more complex than standard railroad equipment. When they failed, replacement took longer and cost more. Only 127 train masters were built between 1953 and 1957. For context, EMD built over 2,600 GP7s in roughly the same period. The market had spoken. Railroads wanted standardization, not innovation. By 1958, Fairbanks Morse locomotive sales had collapsed. The company built a handful of switchers and yard units, but road freight locomotive orders were essentially zero. Railroads that had purchased Fairbanks Morse units were actively trying to sell them or retire them early. The Milwaukee Road started trading in their Fairbanks Morse fleet for EMD units as quickly as possible. The Southern Railway quietly scrapped H1644 switchers that were barely 10 years old because keeping them running was too expensive. Fairbanks Morse made a final attempt to stay competitive. In 1958, they partnered with Consolidated Diesel Electric Corporation, a joint venture between Fairbanks Morse and another manufacturer, to develop a new line of simplified locomotives using the opposed piston engine in a more maintainable package. The effort went nowhere. By then, railroads had standardized so completely on EMD and general electric equipment that no amount of engineering refinement could overcome the installed base advantage. In 1963, Fairbanks Morse formally exited the locomotive market. The company returned to what it did best, stationary diesel engines for power generation and marine applications. The opposed piston engine continued serving in submarines and power plants for decades, proving the fundamental design was sound. But for railroad applications, the operational demands and maintenance realities made it unviable. The locomotives themselves lingered for years. Some railroads operated Fairbanks Morse units into the 1970s squeezing every last mile from machines they desperately wanted to retire, but couldn't afford to replace immediately. The train masters, despite their troubled reputation, found a strange second life with short-line railroads and industrial operations that needed high horsepower and could tolerate maintenance headaches. A few survive today in museums, mechanical oddities that remind us of a road not taken. The financial damage to Fairbanks Morse was severe, but not fatal. The locomotive division had never been the company's core business, but the reputational cost was permanent. Fairbanks Morse became a cautionary tale, brilliant engineering defeated by operational incompatibility. Their locomotives were technically advanced. They delivered measurable performance advantages in controlled conditions. None of that mattered when railroads calculated life cycle costs and maintenance burdens. The collapse of Fairbanks Morse in the railroad market highlights a brutal truth about industrial equipment. Performance alone doesn't determine success, supportability does. Railroads operate in a world where downtime is catastrophic and standardization is survival. An engine that's 10% more efficient but requires specialized training, unique parts, and twice the shop time is a liability, not an asset. EMD understood this instinctively. Their 567 engine wasn't the most thermally efficient design. It wasn't the most power dense, but it was robust, well-supported, and familiar to thousands of mechanics across hundreds of railroads. Parts were everywhere. Training was universal, documentation was comprehensive, EMD sold locomotives, but they really sold operational predictability. Fairbanks Morse tried to sell technical superiority. The opposed piston engine was genuinely innovative. The thermodynamic advantages were real. The compact packaging was impressive, but none of those benefits translated into lower total cost of ownership once maintenance complexity and parts availability entered the equation. The Milwaukee Roads experience tells the story. In the early 1950s, their mechanical department calculated that Fairbanks Morse units delivered slightly better fuel economy than EMD GP7s on mountain grades. By the late 1950s, the same mechanical department calculated that the maintenance cost differential completely overwhelmed fuel savings. A Fairbanks Morse H1544 consumed 5% less fuel than a GP7 but required 120% more maintenance labor. The math was clear. The Milwaukee Road standardized on EMD, other railroads followed identical paths. 
Initial enthusiasm based on performance specifications gave way to operational regret as maintenance costs accumulated. Fairbanks Morse's sales team could show fuel consumption graphs and tractive effort curves all day. Railroad shop foremen showed management maintenance hour reports and parts cost invoices. The shop foreman won every time. By 1970, most Fairbanks Morse locomotives had been retired or relegated to the least critical assignments. A few train masters still worked, their 2,400 horsepower rating making them useful despite their maintenance demands. But the writing was clear. The opposed piston engine had no future in North American railroading. The technology itself wasn't wrong. Fairbanks Morse engines still power ships and generate electricity in remote locations today. The opposed piston design works beautifully. When maintenance access isn't time critical, and when the support infrastructure is designed around the engine's specific requirements. In a submarine where the engine is the heart of the vessel and the crew is trained specifically on that engine, the design makes perfect sense. But railroads aren't submarines. Railroads operate hundreds or thousands of locomotives across vast networks. Standardization reduces complexity. Commonality reduces costs. A brilliant engine that requires unique expertise is a burden, not an advantage. Fairbanks Morse learned this lesson at tremendous cost. They built submarines on rails, machines that carried the DNA of military precision engineering into an industry that valued operational simplicity above technical elegance. The opposed piston engine was too sophisticated for its own good. It demanded more from maintenance crews than railroads were willing to give. The market share numbers tell the final story. At their peak in 1952, Fairbanks Morse held roughly 7% of the North American diesel locomotive market. By 1963, when they exited production, their share was effectively zero. EMD controlled over 70%. The rest belonged to General Electric and a few smaller players. Fairbanks Morse had been erased. The legacy is complex. Engineering enthusiasts celebrate Fairbanks Morse as innovators who tried something genuinely different. Railroad historians view them as a cautionary example of complexity defeating itself. The opposed piston locomotive remains a fascinating technical footnote, a brilliant idea that failed because operational reality matters more than theoretical performance. The railroad industry is merciless. It rewards reliability, standardization, and total cost of ownership. It punishes uniqueness, complexity, and maintenance burden. Fairbanks Morse built engines tough enough for submarine warfare. They built locomotives powerful enough to haul freight through mountain passes but they couldn't build a support ecosystem that made those locomotives economically viable in daily railroad operations. In the end, the submarines on rails sank, not from mechanical failure, but from economic unsustainability. Fairbanks Morse proved that being technically superior isn't enough. You also have to be operationally practical. They weren't, and the railroad industry showed no mercy.